Perhaps one of the rarest of human experiences is discovering a new planet in our solar system. In 1846, the planet Neptune was discovered, usually credited to Urbain Le Verrier, though there were other independent discoverers around the same time. This was done through studying perturbations in the motions of the planets. Something was tugging oddly on the planet Uranus. Le Verrier knew that, that there had to be another planet out there. Since then, no further planets have been found, other than the discovery of Pluto by Clyde Tombaugh in 1930, which is really a Kuiper Belt object, of which many more minor planets have been found in recent years, but nothing large, until perhaps now. In recent years, it has been noticed that some objects in the outer solar system are perturbed in such a way that another large planet is increasingly suspected to exist beyond the orbit of Neptune. My guest today is searching for this hypothesized Planet 9. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. Constantine Bettigian, Assistant Professor of Planetary Science at California Institute of Technology. Dr. Bettigian graduated with a bachelor's degree in astrophysics in 2008. He won the Lawrence Deck Award for his thesis, The Dynamical Stability of the Solar System. He is on the 2015 Forbes list of 30 scientists under 30 who are changing the world. Dr. Batigan, welcome to the program. Uh, it's great to be here. Now, Dr. Batigan, this is what you're doing in looking for Planet Nine. You're looking for the first planet we've discovered since arguably Clyde Tombaugh and Pluto, but certainly Neptune in, what was it, 1846? That's right, 1846, yeah. What led you to suspect that there may be a ninth planet in the outer solar system? Uh, put succinctly, it's the structure of the distant solar system. So if you go beyond the orbit of Neptune, right, so the, to the outer edges of the solar system, what lies beyond is a field of icy debris that is cumulatively known as the Kuiper Belt. The first Kuiper Belt object that was discovered, as you already mentioned, was actually discovered by Clyde Tambo, and that is Pluto. Pluto is a is a member of, of a much broader population of icy objects known as the Kuiper Belt. And if you look at the most distant orbits within the Kuiper Belt, right, so these are things that take 10,000 years to revolve around the sun one time, then what you will note is that all of their orbits point in the same direction, roughly, and they kind of lie in the same plane. So it looks like something is corralling them into, into a group into a cluster and really what that what that structure is telling you is that there's a gravitational influence beyond the eight known planets of the solar system and there indeed exists a ninth planet uh, which lives far far away now how far so our current best estimates place it at an orbit which is about the mean distance is about 500 astronomical units so so 500 times more distant uh, from the sun as is the earth. So this puts it onto kind of a similar orbital period as some of these very long period Kuiper Belt objects, also about 10,000 years. So a 10,000 year orbit. So this is, I guess that would be, it would probably be a very elliptical orbit, would it? Uh, yeah, so the orbit uh, is unlike those of the rest of the solar system. Um, the rest of the solar system's orbits are are 
pretty circular. They're maybe out of round by a few percent, but nothing too significant. Planet Nine uh, has an eccentricity which is which is substantial. So it's, it's at least 20%, probably more like 30%, so an eccentricity of 0.3. We used to think back three years ago when, when we first made the announcement that it was actually more eccentric than that. Uh, so in the first couple papers, I used uh, an eccentricity of 0 0.6. Over the last couple of years, I've done a tremendous amount of calculations, which kind of lowered that best fit uh, by a factor of two or so. So an eccentricity of 0.3 is kind of standard if you look at planets around other stars. So extrasolar planets very often will have eccentricities of order 0.3, but it is indeed unusual for a solar system object. So it would have an eccentric orbit, meaning that it would pass closer to the sun at certain times and further away from the sun when it was at, I suppose that's called the semi-major axis. So what how far and how close does it get to the sun do you think so far that's a that's a great question so i think at closest approach uh it gets down to maybe 300 astronomical units maybe a tiny bit less maybe 290 but but you really can't push it below that without um ruining the outer, outer solar system's uh structure that we observe so we know pretty well that its its closest approach is about 300 astronomical units. Its furthest approach, what we call aphelion, is somewhat less, uh, somewhat more poorly constrained. And that's because in the calculations, there's a degeneracy between the semi-major axis and eccentricity to an extent. So I can make the orbit of planet nine slightly bigger at the expense of making it slightly more eccentric and still match the data pretty well. So, but to kind of give you an overall sense at aphelion, so at furthest point, it's going to be about 620, 650, something like that. Now, what does that tell you about the size of this uh, object? So what's remarkable is that we don't know anything about what Planet Nine physically looks like, right? All we know, all that the calculations give us is the mass, right? Because that's all that matters for gravity. That said, five Earth mass objects are exceedingly common around other sun-like stars. In fact, as it turns out, this is every, maybe one of the main takeaways from the Kepler mission, is that the most common type of planet in the galaxy is a five-ish Earth mass object. And these bodies tend to kind of fall into two different categories. Some of them are only a factor of two bigger than, uh, than the Earth, and, and others are, are quite a bit bigger, maybe a factor of three. So uh, we really don't know what the physical radius of Planet Nine is, and that's what makes the search so attractive. We're looking for something that that we really are have no kind of physical Bayesian prior for. We don't know what we're going to find. Now that's always, at least since Kepler, been somewhat of a mystery. Why does the solar system not have a super Earth? Um, Absolutely. So this could be our solar system super earth that perhaps got ejected early in the the uh, history of the solar system now if that's the case what kind of a planet would this be what what might it look like yeah so i think that as far as the best guess for its its physical structure i think it it would be an object which is a large icy core so to speak so it's a it's a big ice ball kind of like Uranus and Neptune engulfed in an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, which probably, uh, and this is just a educated guess, uh, educated by exoplanets, uh, probably, you know, something like 3% or 10% by mass. So if I was to take a guess, I would, I would assume that it's five Earth masses of ice and rock kind of enveloped by a fraction of an Earth mass in a hydro ex kind of extended hydrogen helium atmosphere. And the remarkable thing about an atmosphere like that 
placed very, very far from, um, from the sun is that it should be quite reflective. The theoretical models tell us that such an atmosphere sort of should be basically be what, what's called a Rayleigh scatterer because most of the condensables are gone from the atmosphere. But again, they we're kind of getting into, at that point, we're getting into more speculative aspects of the theory. So you say reflective. Now, that would imply that it would be more detectable. Of course, this is not an easy thing to detect. So how do you narrow it down? Uh, how do you find Planet Nine? Great question. Um, it is, a, so the, the short answer is it's extremely challenging. We don't know where Planet Nine is on its orbit. And the reason we don't know that is because all the only observations we have of the distant solar system, the Kuiper Belt objects themselves, are their orbits not the full arcs? Because, as I mentioned earlier, it takes 10,000 years for the uh, these objects to go around the sun, and um, we we haven't been alive that long. <laughs> and and so, at the end of the day, we we simply don't know where it is on its orbit. But we can use other constraints to to kind of rule out some of fractions of the orbit. Uh, one such interesting constraint is is actually spacecraft trajectories. So Planet 9 at closest approach would be at about 300 astronomical units and as far as we can tell that would give rise to a detectable deviation of say the Cassini spacecraft over its course that is not seen. So we know it's not at perihelion at closest approach. It'd also be bright enough to be detectable by you know, conventional surveys at perihelion, so we kind of know it's not there. But then we r kind of rapidly lose precision as you move further and further away from the sun along the orbit. So our best guess always is that it's at close to aphelion, the most distant uh, point along the orbit. That more or less must be true, uh, not must be true, but it's it's likely to be true simply because on the Keplerian orbit you spent more time um, at aphelion, but ultimately we are stuck with the problem of having to explore a pretty large swath of the sky. Now that's interesting, you say the Cassini spacecraft, so we can actually tell noticeable deviations of uh, gravitational deviations from spacecraft that are in uh, or were in the case of Cassini in the yep. outer solar system. Now, what about New Horizons? Can you see anything from that? Yeah, so New Horizons, not so much because New Horizons is uh, headed the uh, into the other direction. The advantage with Cassini, and for this type of calculation, Cassini for now remains the only game in town, is that it was in orbit for a long, long time. So you kind of have a large arc of the Saturnian. Um, orbit to pretty good precision. There's still complications that arise in there, namely, how do you properly account for all the maneuvers, right? Every time you introduce non-gravitational accelerations, you, you have to somehow account for that in the model, and that introduces um, errors. So there, this is still very much kind of an ongoing problem, but it is clear, I think, that if Planet Nine was at its closest approach to the sun, then you would really see a detectable perturbation onto Saturn and by extension onto Cassini. Now, do you see anything with like Uranus and Neptune um, perturbed? Because as, as I recall, there used to be, and it was discounted, but there used to be abnormalities in the uh, orbits of Neptune that made people in the past think maybe there might be a planet out there. Do you see anything weird with the orbits of the uh, ice giants? Uh, no, and that's that's simply because the data is insufficiently good. I mean, with Cassini, right, you get something like 100 meters precision, which is, which is astonishing. We just don't know the ephemerides of Uranus and Neptune to to such high uh, precision, if my understanding is correct, uh, especially over over long periods of time. So m a lot of this information really does come from spacecraft. So you would need to put a spacecraft around in orbit around whatever planet you're you're interested in, and then wait for the planet to make a, a substantial 
arc around the sun. Of course, the orbital period of Neptune is 164 years, so that's quite a few decades of, of data collection. Now, what instruments are you using to look for Planet Nine? So the primary telescope that we're using is the Subaru telescope. The Subaru telescope is the Japanese National uh, Observatory. It's an amazing eight meter instrument uh, with a huge field of view. So the reason Subaru is so useful is because its field of view is large enough to cover a large swath of the sky all at once, uh, which is something that we require for the search. Now, even with uh, this amazing instrument, however, it is taking us a long, long time to uh, cover our search area. We have a lot of uh, new telescopes coming. Mm -hmm. Inter interesting new instruments like the Large Synaptic Survey Telescope. Yep. If you don't find it with the Subaru Telescope, do you think that you'll nail it with things like the LSST? Yeah, um, I, think, I think that's right. Um, LSST will go down to magnitude, I think, 23 and a half, something like that. And importantly, it will survey the sky multiple times. So LSST will, if we don't find it by 2022, 2023, uh, I think LSST commences in 2022 and we'll get good data by 2023. If we don't find it by then, uh, I think LSST will answer the question. It'll either just directly find Planet Nine, that's option one. Option two, it will at the very least find uh, probably a hundred of these long period Kuiper Belt objects. So uh, from that point of view, we'll be able to do much more uh, precise modeling and uh, constrain the orbit even better. And finally, it will place observational constraints on the orbit of Planet Nine, which will actually allow us to uh, zoom in better to where it is on the sky. Because as you project the orbit onto the night sky and you claim that you did not detect it in this region, that region, right, you kind of exclude more and more of the orbit. So I think that um, LSST will be a hugely important instrument if we don't find Planet Nine by then. My hope is genuinely that we do. Do you think you have it in the data that you've taken from the Subaru telescope? Do you think, do, is your gut feeling that somewhere in that data is Planet Nine? Hard to say. Um, it does not look like it uh, with this, with, but we haven't actually gone through all the data yet. So, you know, of course, we, we've only covered about, at this point, maybe 50% of the search area that that we need so so we're not anywhere we're not done with the survey yeah you know, and this first time we got good data in like a year and a half was this past december uh early december 2018 and there's so much data that we haven't yet shifted through all of it so uh we'll see we'll see um on on first pass doesn't look like it but really we have to be careful so what's the, what is your process when you look at the data? Um, for example, Clyde Tombaugh spent all that time using a blink comparator to look for any kind of movement was, as he was mm -hmm. looking for uh, Neptune. What is the modern process for looking for a planet? I mean, I, I assume you're looking for movement of something, you know, some sort. How do you do that? That's right. So fundamentally, the, the astronomy of... Uh, of how you find a moving object in the solar system has not evolved much. Ultimately, all it is is you take a picture of the night sky, you come back the ni next night, you take that same picture, and then the night after that, and you take another picture, all of the same uh, patch of the sky, and then you compare the three. Of course, the stars that are that are not in the solar system, right, Things that are in the galaxy remain glued to the um, to the night sky. They don't move. And things in the solar system move due to parallax. Now, the difference between how Clyde Tombo did it and how we do it now is that we uh, there are algorithms that that do it for you, so to speak. And this is really where my partner in crime and collaborator Mike Brown uh, is kind of the expert. So, so these, these algorithms effectively look for, identify sources of light on the picture and then look for motion, right? And then, so you come up with 
you basically train your machine learning algorithm to, to do it. And then it comes up with, with a bunch of candidates. And uh, once you have a list of candidates, which can be say a thousand or a couple thousand, something that a human being can shift through, then you just go through it and just do it by eye from that point. Because ultimately looking through a thousand images is not is not a particularly difficult thing to do. Do you do any citizen science? I, I know that with Kepler, there was the Planet Hunters project where people could actually look manually for transiting exoplanets. Have you done anything like that? Yeah, so with Planet Nine Search, we haven't uh, yet because, in part because we've been basically data limited, right? We got um, good data back in September 2017 and analyze that and uh, the first time we got good data since then was this past december so for now we don't really need the citizen science help but i think that's going to be a huge thing um, once lsst comes online so so i think it's it's more of a uh, issue of how much data we have to play with so we haven't done that yet um, we might do that in the future and on that, we have to go to a break. I want to remind everybody to hit subscribe and click the bell for new episodes of this show. We'll be right back. If you're new to Event Horizon, hit subscribe. It's free, and we upload videos every Thursday, plus additional content. Dr. Batigan, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me back. This idea of captured planets, so it's constrained. We we can't exactly say that there are 10 planets out there. there. There must only be one or two at best, right? That's right. That's right. And in fact, um, you know, even before, even if you suppose you don't know anything about the Kuiper Belt, right? Suppose you've never seen the Kuiper Belt. Uh, you can still ask the question of what is the kind of parameter space that remains in the solar system where you could put a planet and get away with it. And that's a calculation that we have done, uh, and that's it's going to be in an upcoming paper uh, called the Planet Nine Hypothesis, a review paper. And as it turns out, if you just do this calculation, kind of accounting for, okay, you can't mess up the trajectories of spacecraft, you can't mess up the observational surveys, meaning that uh, you know, the, uh, there are constraints on bright objects far away from the sun, a and also you can't put things so far away that they would get stripped away by passing stars. You get a relatively narrow range of parameter space, and, and then if you ask where pl does Planet Nine fall in that kind of island, it falls smack in the center of it. So it's, it's actually an interesting exercise to do. Uh, just because it's a completely kind of model-independent assessment of where could planet, planets be in the solar system that we haven't yet found. One thing I've noticed about following, you know, while following the story, is that it seems that more and more objects are being identified that have these weird orbits that are suggestive of this planet. What is your sense? I mean, is it possible that it's not there? You know, or, or are you convinced that it really is? This this must be. Uh, yeah, so there's a, um, you know, I used to, I used to always answer this question by saying that, that I am something like 6 billion percent sure that Planet Nine is there. But the more correct answer is that there is indeed a false alarm probability to all this, right? And that probability is addressing the question of how likely is it that all of these distant orbits that we see that appear to be clustered together in space are just so by chance, right? And there's a very well-defined answer to that, and the answer is 0.2%. So I am 99.8% confident that Planet Nine really is there. Now, say you find it, and we have a ninth planet again, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> depending on how what people feel about Pluto. Um, <laughs> so we find it. What does this tell us about star system dynamics? Can we look for exoplanets out, you know, outside of our solar system that does it, does it suggest that this is a common phenomenon, that where you have these weird, eccentric outer planets orbiting stars, and could this could be common? Does it give us any information on that, on the study of exoplanets? What a great question. Um, yeah, so I think it's this is, this is something where it becomes immediately intriguing. 
does it immediately tell us that every sun-like star should have a Planet Nine equivalent? Absolutely not, because progressively it looks like the solar system itself is kind of an oddball against the galactic backdrop of, of planetary systems, right? Jupiter-like planets are rare. We don't have a close-in system of super-Earths. Just the solar system is messed up when you compare it with a typical planet, planetary system in the galaxy. So does the solar system having some uh, object like Planet Nine tell us anything else about the galaxy? No. But I think what it would immediately uh, demonstrate, uh, or, or rather the constraints that it would entail, would all be on the early formation of the solar system. We don't really understand at the detailed level the early formation of the solar system. I mean, that's just a true statement. And discovering Planet Nine and characterizing it will yield constraints that we right now just can't imagine. So it'll be huge. It'll be a huge improvement in our understanding of, kind of the origins of our cosmic home. Yeah, the solar system does seem weird. No super Earth, and then it's got, you know, a rare gas giant. How does Saturn play in? Is Saturn sort of like Jupiter? You know, is it is it is it rare? I mean, is that a rare object? Yes, indeed. Uh, so both Saturn and Jupiter are are strangely uncommon. If we kind of believe the current narrative for solar system formation, and this narrative is subject to change always, uh, but the current kind of iteration of narrative, much of the solar system's early evolution was actually shaped by the interplay, the gravitational interplay between Jupiter and Saturn. So we would have had a very, very different planetary system if we only had one of them. So so there's, there's all this detail, which for now, uh, we're just as planet formation theorists just shifting through, right? And and we're not, you know, really, it, it's it's only kind of been in the last decade, decade and a half that we've began to really uncover the role that Jupiter and Saturn's early migration, their movement through the solar system played. Uh, so there's just a tremendous amount of work left to do in this domain. Now, this is somewhat of an offbeat question, but if you know, we one of the ways that, that astronomers look for exoplanets is, as I recall, the radial velocity method, where you're looking for wobbles in the star. Is Planet Nine too far away for us to have a measurable effect that we could look at with, regarding the sun's movement? Uh, yeah, that's right. And really, the the answer to that is, is, yes, the movement itself is tiny, and also that movement is happening over the orbital period of the planet. Right. So it's it's taking that reflex velocity of the sun in order to see it. You'd have to observe the sun for 10,000 years. And although I am indeed planning to live on as a cyborg forever, um, you know, for now, that that type of observation is out of reach. Watching the sun for 10,000 years looking for a planet. Um... Now you say you want to live on as a cyborg. <laughs> or, uh -huh. Are you sure you would? You, would you rather just uh, live on as a uploading yourself into a computer rather than becoming a horrible cyborg? Yeah, what a great question. Yeah, I, I mean, I I haven't I haven't given uh, this sufficient thought to really make the distinction. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I prefer to be just software. No, actually, now that I th really think about it, I think I'd prefer to have some hardware, too. Well, I would imagine you could switch back and forth if you wanted. Just download yourself into a cyborg body if you if that's useful for, for you at the moment. And then you could go back to being in the cloud at at, uh, yeah. at your leisure. Now, you know, it's weird. Some days I feel like I do that already. What, well, without the coffee, I, I feel that's as right. though I'm, yeah, I'm a different person without the coffee than <laughs> I am when, when I actually have and uh, I have it. Now, once this object is found, it's mm -hmm. going to have to have a name. And I know that there's all sorts of procedural stuff from the IAU on determining what, what to name an object. And we've, we, so far with the planets, we, we have legacy names from the Greco-Roman world, you know. Um, yep. Do you have a favorite name that you would uh, like for Planet Nine? Um. I don't, um, but then I also kind of do. So we're 
we're all out of Greco-Roman gods uh, at this point. All of them have been assigned to asteroids and Kuiper Belt objects. I think the demigod of untied shoelaces might still be available, so so that's one option definitely. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's interesting. The name is something that neither me nor Mike, my partner in crime, we we never talk about it, and that's that's in part kind of a um, kind of a superstitious thing, right? It's it's not good to name things that you haven't imaged yet, but. This did not stop a, uh, a group of enthusiasts from creating a change.org page, which is addressed to yours truly, as well as the IAU. Uh, and and their, their suggestion is to name Planet Nine David Bowie, because David Bowie died um, maybe a week before we made the announcement back in 2016. And I've kind of grown to like that suggestion a lot, because then you could have a whole kind of David Bowie etymology, if you will. We can, you can, um, you know, you can name the satellites Ziggy Stardust and stuff. Um, you know, it'd just be, it'd just be a cute way to do it. <laughs> I'm, I am, of course, uh, joking, but only, uh, only partially. <laughs> Half joking about naming a planet David Bowie. Yeah, you know how how sweet would that be? You know, you you would just forever. Um, you know, forever uh, demand people to, whenever they refer to it in scientific literature, to refer to it as Planet Bowie. <laughs> After all, Uranus, you know, Uranus was, uh, before it was called Uranus, was called George, basically, the Georgia Sidium. Uh, so we had Jupiter, Saturn, and George. Uh, George, by the way, is another good name for a planet. George, yeah, I, well, I wonder too, there actually is a, uh something from the Greco-Roman pantheon that has not been named. And it's, uh, the, the Romans particularly would build temples to the unknown god. So you can mm. name it unknown. You know, that's, or untitled. Untitled. Like, uh, untitled, like those, uh, you know, documents on your computer. Uh, that's a good one, yeah. Untitled, but in parentheses, David Bowie. Yes, <laughs> that's right. I love it. All right, Dr. Vitigan, thank you for joining us today. We've run out of time, and um, I hope you'll come back with us, especially after you find the planet. Well, thanks so much for having me. This was so much fun. The discovery of a ninth planet in our solar system will be among the chief scientific discoveries of the 21st century, and it does increasingly look like it's probably out there. It's fun to imagine what it might be like, and if we do find it, when will we visit it? There will once again be a planet in our solar system that we've never seen up close, and if it is a core of a gas giant, what would that be like? With any luck, these will be questions we will be asking relatively soon. And indeed, Planet Nine could be found at any time. I look forward to what we learn about it. John? Yes, Anna? I'm guessing you have a suggestion? Of course I do, John. Well, go on then. Lay it on me. Plu 2.0 What? Plu 2? You're suggesting we name it Plu 2? Well, I suppose that's close enough. I like it, but I'm going with Nerptoon. This isn't a cartoon, John. If it were, you'd probably have better script writers, Anna. You wrote the script, John. No, that was Aaron. Joining me next week will be historian, reenactor, and YouTube personality John Townsend for a little bit different type of a show themed on history. See you then.